Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV, where we talk about Arnold Jacobs all of the time. Uh, Puddles couldn't make it to uh, Lorton, Virginia, to the home of John Taylor, but uh, he's back uh, helping the, the uh, Ducks football team prepare for the fall season. But he did ask me to uh, get you his regards. Well, thank you very much. Um, so, John Taylor, so nice to be uh, in your home, and uh, thanks for inviting us. You're more than welcome. And uh, it's something that we've been working on, uh, trying to arrange for about a year, I think, to, mm -hmm. to meet up, to, to, get, right. to get your, uh, your input and uh, remembrances of Mr. Jacobs. Now, John, you uh, 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 played with the North Carolina Philharmonic, the uh, Buffalo Philharmonic, Philharmonic, or North Carolina Symphony. Symphony, yeah. It was Buffalo, a touring orchestra. Yeah, it sort of, sort of still is. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Buffalo Philharmonic, Quebec Symphony, and then in 1971, you joined the United States Army Band mm -hmm. and were, was uh, with the band until 1991. And you were very instrumental in the Brian Fredrickson's book, uh, Song and Wind, as the uh, editor yes. of that book. And the cover photo. That's right. That's great. Well, that's a lot of... Uh, that's a lot of uh, Input uh, into that into that project for Brian and for Mr. Jacobs. Um, you started studying with Mr. Jacobs in 1962. 1962. It was during, I guess it was Easter break. It was we didn't get these lavish two weeks in Fort Lauderdale kind of breaks and things. It was, uh, it was a short bit of time. But I was was um, University of Platt, uh, Wisconsin at Platteville at that time. Okay. It was Platteville State at that time. And I booked a lesson with him um, so I could learn the little things because I thought I was a pretty good tuba player. And um, was greeted with his saucer and white cup of coffee in his hand and followed him out through the kitchen and down the back stairs. And he said, well, I'm not too handy with some things. It was cluttered. There was a path through. And, and uh, back to the studio was right under the living room. And um, so I proceeded to play about two bars of the Ernest Williams trumpet concerto been transcribed for tuba. There wasn't much literature for tuba in those days. We, right. uh, we used horn books, basically, yep. and trumpet books, Schlossberg, Koprosch, the um, 335 melodious etudes by the Pot Pot Max Pottig, you yeah. know. And um, so anyway, I played about two bars of that, and he stopped me and said, uh, you know, uh, I don't play B-flat tuba very much, but give me your horn. He had a horn there from Carl Fisher that was a bow and vinyl. And proceeded to play all over the horn, and it was just, you know, my jaw had to be picked up off the floor. He says, I don't believe anybody could hear you in the front row, because at that time, teaching was the tuba was a pseudo string bass in the band, and, and you had right. this kind of kind of sound. And the only recording was the, the Bill Bell and his tuba, and, and one thing and another. And uh, so I kind of was dazzled by that, as I think everyone was, and uh, proceeded to go home and practice and took another lesson and uh, later in the week and really didn't make much progress. Uh, I hitchhiked in a couple of times and when I was there in the summer, uh, school was off and I worked as a repairman at Lion Healy and I took a lesson a week and still didn't quite get it. And that summer in August, he went to the Gunnison band camp, mm -hmm. and that's where he recorded the Strauss Concerto. And as soon as I found out about that, I ordered it, and it mm -hmm. came, and I put it on, and, you know, it, it's a spectacular recording. Yeah. And um, that came in September, I think, and by Thanksgiving, I took a lesson when I was, was home, and he said, you finally got it. So it was that oral perception that he tried to teach is get the music in the head yeah. is reflected by the music that comes out of the tuba. Yeah. And so that one thing I, I really want to want to say about Arnold Jacobs, and there's there's legend and lore about that says, well, he only had one lung. Right, right. right. Well, that's really not true. He had right. both lungs, right. but he had diminished capacity. I had about five and a half liters. He had barely three and a half, but yeah. he had spirometers there to check it, so it wasn't right. some fantasy, but you hear people still, oh, he only had one lung. Well, he really didn't. And like Ed Kleinhammer said, he never heard him take a breath. He was so quick. So quick. And, yeah. and filled up everything. And uh, that's something I still can't do very well. But, but anyway, from there on, um, 
the next summer I came back and was a between our junior and senior year and my senior year I finally said well I met Don Heron who had graduated from Wisconsin and was living in Chicago and he said yeah come we got this apartment down on Roscoe Street and three of us there and it's 33 bucks a month each for with rent was a hundred dollars a month for this three four walk up and um, so when I got out of college I did that and I asked I asked uh, Mr. Jacobs just you know, I said, is this wor worth doing? Oh, yes, my life. So then in, within that summer and winter and the next, um, I was, was capable of not only subbing and playing second tuba in the orchestra, but getting a job. And um, So some of the summer of? That would be summer of 66. Okay. I graduated in 1964. Okay. College. And uh, so... Um, uh, there, you know, and so really, and the nice thing about it was, is during the symphony season, he sent a letter to, it was John Edmonds at that time, was the, the manager of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, and I'm poor, I'm broke, and I need free lessons from Arnold Jacobs, and you would get a scholarship from the Civic Orchestra, was playing in the Civic Orchestra, mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and, and you got a lesson a week, for the symphony season and at the end of the, the first season I'll never forget it I was there and he said you know he said your scholarship is about to run out but don't tell Gazella now but I'm going to give you my scholarship and from there on until the last time I saw him he never charged me for a lesson wow you know even even in in the 90s I would go when I was in Chicago I'd go for a lesson I'd say how much is it? And he said, I couldn't charge you. And it, it sounds egotistical, but I was one of his boys. Mm -hmm. Don Heron, Paul Walton, me, mm -hmm. Dave Federley, mm -hmm. was the, the people that he uh, virtually adopted. Mm -hmm. And like Roger uh, Rocco. Roger Rocco. Roger was yeah. a student of mine, and when I left Chicago, I told Arnold, I said, you know, this kid's really got talent. and." just doesn't have any money at all but you know mm -hmm. and developed Roger and it was funny because the army band just had a reunion and I'm president of the alumni association so I had to get up before a concert and have this sort of conversation and there was a young lady there who was from I think Northbrook and she said oh you're a tuba player from Chicago do you know Roger Rocco and I said yeah he was a student of mine and she said he was the one that really pushed me to practice and develop so it's a really small world Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, and up up till he passed away, I, you know, he was, I uh, can't charge you. And that wow. was a, when it was 150 bucks a crack or something. Yeah, you know? that's great. But anyway, he was an incredibly generous man. We, we would try, we'd go out, and try and pay for the beer, try and pay for dinner. No, no, he'd pull out this wallet. And, mm -hmm. um, I'll never forget, I had... I think I had two dollars, and he said, "You need to hear the concert tonight." And I went down and said, "Well, all that's left are four-dollar seats or something like that." Well, you need to hear Stokowski conduct. And he handed me a five-dollar bill and said, "Pay me when you got it." Mm -hmm. That's great, John. Um, just getting back to those initial uh, several lessons, um, what do you remember uh, with uh, any specific? You talked about generally the aural concept. Uh, which is certainly he was well known for that. Was there anything that for you in particular um, that, that he well, was I th asking for? It, it's it's very simplistic to say, but he would say, "Copy me, copy Bud, play it the way Bud would." Bud Herseth, mm -hmm. principal trumpet, said he had the greatest musical mind of anybody he'd ever known, and Arnold Jacobs had a marvelous musical mind. Yeah, but it was essentially inspire yourself to play the etude or excerpt or whatever it was as Arnold Jacobs would play it or as Bud Herseth would play it. And that it, it was sort of it. I mean, there, you know, everybody was individually yeah. um, challenged by him and um, I didn't have the greatest musical mind so he would fuss at me about nick and notes and things like that and, and he would play it and listen to me and then yeah. Play back the tape recorder in your head. You always talked about the tape recorder in your head, and that you want to play it back and and um, 
memorize your music with music. In other words, have it have it really in here, and you're just using the the, the printed music as a as a reminder. Yeah. Of, so imitation, lots of imitation then. Imitation was was I think was one of his biggest concepts uh, that that overall that I think a lot of people got was that that he wanted you to to um, you know, play it, play it like, play it like me, and he would play it for you. Did, but, and and when he get a new etude or something, he'd say, "Let me stylize it for you." He would play it, and then mm -hmm. yeah, that was amazing. His his stylistic approach was like nobody else. Well, it was all you know, music. And one of the things that that came to me later in life is he was a wonderful singer. Yeah. He had a really deep bass voice sang with the Philadelphia Orchestra because somebody became, quote, indisposed. And they called over to a solfege teacher and said, do you have a basso that can really solfege and read? And he says, yeah, Arnold Jacobs. So he sang the Stravinsky King of the Stars mm -hmm. in the Philadelphia Orchestra. But his sound was a reflection of the way he sang. When, yeah. you, when you heard him sing, it, it became, his sound on the tuba became a reflection of the way he sang. Right. Yeah. The, yeah. The vibrato and everything. You know. Did do you re, you recall? Um, did he ever explain to you why he wanted to imitate? Why it was good? Why it was good to have uh, that that sound in the in the mind to have that tape recorder going? Well, be, because that's the that's the real basis of making music. If you don't have an oral concept of what you want it to sound like, it's 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 like Bud Hurst. You know he knew exactly how he wanted it to sound and, and then it was a reflection of, of that and, and I think that's the basis of how really fine artists play is they have, um, you know, how do you play the violin unless you know what it's going to sound like, you know, because there's, there's a whole lot of, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's the basis of, of uh, the creation of a lot of music. By, by really fine artists is, is they have an oral concept of what they want it to sound like. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes um, a matter of, of the body reproducing what you want. I mean, it, it's, it's, he would always say like throwing a ball. You know, if you want to throw a ball and have it, or wad of paper and have it hit the wastebasket, you don't think about, well, let's see, this is going to go here and this is going to, you know, start doing that and all of a sudden you can't even throw the, the ball. Because, but, you know, if you allow the mind to direct what you're doing, and it, it's a strong concept, it, that's what's going to come out of the bell. Yeah. So, product oriented, not methodology. Yeah. He, yeah. He, you know, uh, he used to laugh because he would have people come there for, I think, for a, you know, a line on their resume, and he had a couple of guys show up, and they were studying with a guy who was into dental appliances and. Supposedly, Mr. Ambusher fix it, and he never ever talked about Ambusher. He said it's the result of the musical demands you put on it, and forget about it. He didn't never talked about tonguing. Going to screw up a brass player, start talking about tonguing, mm -hmm. you know. But he would always laugh about the people who'd come from the methodology folks, and he said it, it's it's simple, you know. It's it's like you don't have to know what's happening in your car. This course is on his. CDs, but how to drive your car. You start it and you push this pedal, it goes, you push that one and it stops. Mm -hmm. And in the simplistic mode, if you, you know, da da da, you hear that, you want to reproduce it on the tuba, just play back the tape mm -hmm. and allow the, allow the function to happen. Yeah. We used to joke amongst us about, about every fifth lesson was devoted to science because he would have a new something or other to try. And he had the, the pneumographs, which are like a lie de They don't do that anymore, I guess, but these lie detectors. You yeah. know, you, and you take an inhalation, and there would be a gauge there, and you could, you know, these kind of things. And so he'd always have a new, a new gadget or something he wanted to try, or, or a new, new teaching concept. And so the civic guys got to, mm. <laughs> got to try them out. Well, so uh, that, that's interesting, you know, a new teaching concept. You, you you were involved with Mr. Jacobs, sixty two to ninety eight probably. Mm -hmm. Did you notice any change in his his pedagogical approach? Did not, he? Not really. Yeah. I mean, it was pretty much 
pretty much the same. I mean, he taught primarily music, mm -hmm. and then the the things if you were having hang-ups with breathing or whatever, he would address that away from give you some exercises, a bag to blow up or candles to blow out or straws or tubes in the mouth or whatever. But he always came back to the music. And um, it was, was very much music oriented. Um, and I think as he progressed, he became, um, I think he got less interested in the, he, he learned how to apply what he learned from us playing with his new gadgets to apply it without using those and those are sort of a last resort he would have somebody that that just couldn't take a breath or something yeah. like that but his um, his teaching you know one of the things is people try and make this difficult and he made it simple mm -hmm. you know uh, and I to me it didn't it didn't change a great deal at all that aspect of his teaching. Didn't that aspect change. of his teaching, you know, and overall, what what I experienced with him didn't didn't change a great deal, you know. It was still the music and and the oral concept and 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 I um, I have a York tuba that uh, was was given by a man who played in the army band back in the 30s. Wow. Belonged to Donatelli, and he played in the army band. Got out in in 1940, I think. 37 to 4th, but right, got drafted back into the, the Navy in World War II and was in the shipyard band at in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Shipyard was a big deal up there then. He studied with Donatelli and he bought this York tuba from him. And Arnold saw it and said, my, I didn't know he had that. And he just gave it to me um, in relation to a band I play in and, and one thing or another. And, um, but he, you know, I, Federley was, we were at the tuba conference at, at Northwestern. He knew I had to, he said, well, play it a little bit. And he's standing there with, I don't know, Danny Pierantoni or somebody. He said, he sounds like Jacobs. I said, well, what do you expect? Right. But. Wow. Well, that's, uh, that's pretty, uh, maybe we can, uh, if you have that tuba in the house? Yeah. We'll have to maybe get a photo of that. Yeah, it's, it's down. So I got it out. I had a sort of mothball. But, yeah. Uh, so uh, during your, your 25, 26 years of studying with him, you went back. Why did you keep going back? You, kn you went initially, Just, but why did you, you keep going back? Well, I guess love of the man. I mean, it was he treated us like his own son. Um, and he always had something to, something to, to give. It was like a, a tune-up, you know, mm -hmm. it's like a car you can drive it so far and then you need to go back and sort of see where you are and never anything really dramatic but you know it, it was just I was drawn to going back to see him. John you were in Chicago for uh, a, fair, a little, fair amount of time did you ever have the opportunity to play with the Chicago Symphony? Yeah I was was really lucky in that um, Arnold had always was liable to get bronchitis. He suffered from asthma and, and breathing disorders. And so he would call up barely audible on the phone. You got to go in for me this morning. And um, so I was like, I played Schulte's first downtown uh, concert, which was a Dvorak cello concerto and um, uh, uh, a Bartok dance suite. Mm -hmm. And uh, never forget that it was before they ruined Orchestra Hall. It was how it was, and the, the men's locker room was kind of nasty and all that. But I remember going down. I didn't play the second half. And they were doing the, I think, the Schubert Great C Major. And Frank Miller, you could tell where Frank Miller sat, and you could hear cellos, but it was just like you know, mm -hmm. God's cello. Right. And. Um, then I got to do some other things, uh, played second tuba on the Verez Arcana. It was Verez's 75th anniversary, and, and that we recorded that with Martin on. Dale Clevenger joined the orchestra. I was, uh, we were rehearsing that and Rite of Spring for the 66 Spring Tour. And uh, Ed Kleinhammer and I became very good friends. He didn't live too far from my, my folks. And um, I was always really a couple really flattering things happened that he would call me a colleague 
uh, he died this last year and, and uh, just my wife and I took a road trip up and saw him about three three or four years ago and mm -hmm. spent a weekend with him. Oh, wow. And um, then we, um, I was in Buffalo when I came home for Christmas. I called him up and said, well, I'll see you at the hall tomorrow morning, you're rehearsing. And I'm sitting down, they had some old theater seats there, and Ben was the kind of guy that watched the door and, and only in voice only. And uh, John Weicker came down and said, Jake, sick, get his horn, get on the stage. So um, I got his horn and got up on the stage, and it was Sixth and Erling was conducting, and we did Tchaikovsky fifth on that program. And um, the best compliment I ever got in the world was we played, I think we, I don't know if we did that in Milwaukee, but anyway, the last performance was in Orchestra Hall, I think it was Saturday night. And the, the tuba and the trombones had let the trumpets get out first. And then, and I'm standing there with the tuba, and Bud comes back and backhands me in the belly and says, bravo, get going. And That's nice. That's high praise. really was. And the Reiner recording of uh, and Heldenleben, pa 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 pa, is not. That's Ed Kleinhammer. On uh, playing on the bass trombone. Yeah. Playing the, the euphonium tenor tuba yeah, part on the bass trombone. Yeah, because because pa 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 like this, and Reiner just you know, and um, anyway, Ed was a pretty earthy guy. Yeah. And um, I probably shouldn't say this on camera, but he said, you know, there were these guys, and Reiner just caught on him and said nobody had given a steam off their shit when they left. <laughs> you might have to cut that for your college thing. but I just went cuckoo. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Perfect. Uh, but but he and I developed a, a really close relationship and, and I don't know why, but I did get to sub in the orchestra quite a bit. And uh, it was great. I mean, all you had to do was play your part and the rhythm was so good and pitch and everything and you know it 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 was just i mean it was so thrilling that you could just sit there and and everything was so precise mm -hmm. did uh um I, I know there was a special bond with with Klein Hammer and jacobs you know they didn't have to talk they just had they had these little visual signals from what other people have told me mm -hmm. did you develop any of that with with Klein Hammer? oh yeah yeah I've, I've got a funny story in the Dvorak cello concerto there's ba 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 mm -hmm. and it re it repeats but it's a little different mm -hmm. and for whatever reason Ed knew that I was reading the wrong line and he reached over and stepped on my foot because we had the boxes there, and he stepped in my foot, and I knew what it was, and I didn't fall in. And so when he and Doug Yo put out that book, I sent sent my copy to him and asked him to sign it to him, and he stapled a Band-Aid on the cover for my foot. And he always used to say, "How's your foot doing?" But but you know he would all all he would do is just with his thumb when you get to a number or letter. Oh, he didn't do it like that. He just did. No, that. he yeah. just do do that. Yeah. And uh, but. That, that was our that was our little joke about my foot. Now, when you were uh, played um, second tuba to Jacobs, you mentioned the, mentioned the uh, Varez recording mm -hmm. um, with Martin on. Just those times when you were uh, with Jacobs on stage, did you notice any particular uh, I don't know rituals or pre-performance habits? Or <laughs> no, or <laughs> he would just him? take out his horn and. You know all the triple tonguing and everything, and yeah. that was that was the warm up. Yeah. And he might oil his valves, and he might not. And then up the stage he'd go, and we were. He always, he always just sort of was trying to lose weight. And there was a product called AIDS that was nothing more than a a uh, caramel, A Y D E S oh, or something yeah. like that. Okay. It's long before was the it laxative did. or something. No, it was a caramel. And you're, caramel candy, and you were supposed to eat this one was supposed to assuage your appetite, you know. Well, I always had a pocket full of these things, so we got through whatever it was, and we had a long break. So he says, one an AIDS? And I said, oh, yeah, sure. So we're both smacking on these caramels. Martinon stops and says, well, back to letter whatever it was, oh, and no. right of spring. And you never seen two guys try and chew up two caramels quicker than that. <laughs> and, uh, but he didn't, you know, he, he just... Everything his his embouchure was so responsive, and it was just 
S-shaped, you see it in the Farkas book, and yeah. if you look at buds, it's the same thing. And he had just had this, this huge resonance. Yeah. Like when, when he would sing, he could touch the top of his head and feel it vibrate. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, uh, he didn't really have anything. Um, I will remember we were in Carnegie Hall and I was trying to develop a concept and I'm there playing the, the, the melody of the Carnival of Venice and he says, you're in Carnegie Hall, don't play that out here on the stage. And there wasn't a soul in the house. Herseth and Chickowitz had gone over to Manny's. They were selling off the Vincent Bach collection, and they both bought a rotary valve trumpet. Mm -hmm. And Chickowitz is playing on his, and Bud, the valves were frozen on his. And he says, well, at least mine works. <laughs> but uh, that turned out to be a, just a terrific, it was a heckle, and, and Geyer fixed it up for him, and it was just a terrific instrument. But, do, do you think he was telling you not to play that on stage as, like, in, as in rehearsing it, or...? No, it was just where we were. Oh, okay. Carnegie Hall is a sacred place, okay. and you should, you know respected as such yeah and he had tremendous respect for music and and musicians the the worst he ever called somebody was a schlub mm -hmm. he's right. a schlub and um, um, you know and he spoke in that people hear him on on these CDs and things and think well it's kind of stilted but if you listen to a radio I mean he was a part-time radio announcer at one time if you listen to the Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons on, on radio, it's that, that, that style of speech. Yeah, it's definitely from the 40s and 50s. Yeah, radio. And, 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 and third, well, the 30s actually. I mean, you yeah. went to Curtis in yeah. the 30s. And, um, but he really didn't have any, any thicker things. He'd run over parts, you know, a little bit, but, but only. Okay, so no, no habits. Just there wasn't it. No, he he really didn't. That was probably the one one great thing about him as a, as a as a musician was that he didn't have any fixed things that he did for warm up or anything like that. He didn't rely on those. No, yeah, no. Right, right. We talked a little bit about Mr. Herseth and and Mr. Kleinheimer. Any any other memories from other other musicians well, of the CSO? Um, I mean, Chris Foley was funny because he was a great player, but he would come, put his horn together, and play a couple notes, put it down, and join the cribbage game. Play that the cards, was his warm-up. Right, right. Ian Weicker, and I've forgotten who all played. Warren Benfield was a bass player. Yeah. Um, the one thing was that when you came in to sub, you were treated pretty much as an equal. There, there was, they were very kind you know, and, and wanted you to succeed, and it wasn't any kind of of um, rank or whatever that you find in small orchestras. I mean, there's all kinds of terrible politics that go in there. Yeah. There was there was that, but it, it didn't apply to, to people like me. Um, uh, we were just everybody was just very generous and kind with their their time and help if you if you needed or didn't get something, and and um, you know I. I I laugh because I, I play in a um, community band and the principal trumpet is always squealing out high notes and stuff. The only thing Bud ever did down in the locker room was is the Clark Third Study. Da 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 dee 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 that one. Just to kind of keep and I never heard him play high notes on the stage until he had to. You know? He might might practice a part a little bit, but um, he could play the trumpet call from Zarathustra just fine. He didn't need to sit out there and wail away on it. And uh, but they really, people were just really kind, and uh, it's it's funny because Jay Friedman and I played in the quintet mm -hmm. when he was first in the orchestra, and our other trombone player was Glenn Dodson, mm -hmm. and um, and we had a guy from NBC or CBS that played too that they still had a full time orchestra. The big job in town was Bozo's Circus at that time. I never got to play Bozo's, but Tommy Crown played the. Makes Mutes, Tommy played mm -hmm. that, and it was a noon show for a half hour, and they had a band, um, a little circus band, and they all wore uniforms with little hats, and you know. It was a kid's show, and, and when your kid was born, if you wanted him to get him or her to get there before they were five years old, you sent in for tickets right then. But that was the best, one of the best jobs in town was playing Bozo Circus. But um, uh, there was a coterie of people that did all the, the union band concerts mm -hmm. in the summer and, and Bob Rushford is dead now, Chuck Stein's dead. 
for trumpet players in our quintet and, and Jay and then the um, Paul Undercheck was principal in the Lyric Opera and uh, we had a really good quintet. It made awesome. a lot of money when Title X came around. They had all this money they had to spend before right. the end of the school year. And um, uh, I mean everybody was playing two and three jobs a day but um, but the people in the orchestra were just very kind, and, and the bass players, I got to know Warren Benfield really well. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, um, I came in to do a children's concert, was, was I think was a Nutcracker. And the, Nate Zimberoff was the last chair of bass, and he was right next to the tuba. At that time, they Martin on switched it around to the mm -hmm. other side, but and next to him, and, and <laughs> he points over with his bow, and it says pass it. And he says, now that doesn't mean count four bars and take it. So. <laughs> so, yeah. Do you remember your first uh, time here in the Chicago Symphony? Uh, yeah, I was in was in school, and I looked down and I saw the tuba from up in the gallery. And the gallery were the best seats there. The yeah. sound just came up like this. But I saw Arnold's tuba. I said, "Oh, it must be a Martin," because the the school band director had played briefly in the Navy band, and they had Martins there. Yeah. And. Um, they played a Peter Menon piece or something like that, and it was, it didn't... It didn't light your fire? No, it didn't light my fire. Um, but then, you know, Stokey did, um, um, Stokowski, I should say, um, Ilya Moromets. Okay. And I, one of the most memorable ones was with a German conductor. I can't remember who it was, but they did um, Bruckner Fourth. Wow. Beep, bop, 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 bop. Right. And it was like, it was like 10 tons of concrete being dumped down on the floor. I mean, it was so huge and massive, yeah. the sound. And they did the Janicek Symphony yet, I remember, and stuff. But that, that one performance. And then they did pictures with Martin on, and Arnold played Beedlo on a, uh, Alexander F. He had, was a, I think was a four, and he would had Geyer put some more valves on it for him. And Claudia Cassidy was the music critic, and she was Acidy Cassidy was mm -hmm. very, very critical. Yeah, and she got rid of Kubelik. Yeah, she got rid of Kubelik, and she really shouldn't have because he was he was a good, good conductor. I mean, yeah. Jay always told me he said the best recording the Chicago Symphony ever made was Kubelik's recording of uh, Mob Lost. Right. right. And it's a terrific recording. Yeah. It is one microphone. It was yeah. the old. Anyway, she said the the Beadlow cart was drawn by, it was a golden coach drawn by white chargers. Wow. It was, I mean, it was just amazing. Yeah, that's quite you know, a and, uh, her. and he always told me, he said, well, I always like it when they do it on euphonium, I can sit there with normal heartbeat and respiration. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, uh, but the orchestra, that was the great thing is we being a member of the Civic Orchestra could, could, could get a free ticket in the gallery right. on Friday afternoon. Well, you could substitute teach and make 25 bucks. So you could buy, you'd buy a $2.50 ticket for Thursday night. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but when they did on Heldenleben, I went to every performance. And that was just, you know, just glorious. I mean, that brass section was just absolutely incredible. Yeah. So the, the, the it, I, you know, and, I'm not casting any aspersions, but it will, you know, never happen again, in my opinion. It really was the perfect storm in many, many Yeah, ways. it really was. And, and uh, I, mean, I remember Ed saying, yeah, we got pluggers in every part, you know. And uh, Well, John, it's really great to meet you, finally. Oh, yeah. yeah. And to uh, hear, your, hear your, uh, your thoughts and memories of Jake and CSO and... Yeah, well, oh, it was it was a wonderful time in my life. If I could if I could take my wife along, we've been married for 45 years. Met her in Quebec. Um, um, I would go back and just be in a in a time loop mm -hmm. in those days forever. It was really it was really satisfying. Just so many things and and Jake threw a lot of jobs our way. They would call him up and and I played the Chevy show and I played you know band concerts we played out in a park in Chicago one time and it was a big park and they had a PA system with speakers went all over and it was an Italian guy named Dominic Alberti who was a conductor who was a clarinet player and um, 
<laughs> we played some overture and there was a clarinet cadenza and the guy just squeaked and squawked and the mic is live so all this is going out over the park and Alberti is and he's cussing them out in Italian and English and it's booming out all over these loudspeakers and the band starts to laugh you know and he just went on and on and on <laughs> with this guy you know playing my band concert again you were you know mm -hmm. I mean but but I mean those were just really fun days played stage band at the Lyric and you know yeah. threw it out at the Baldy step in my foot well, Puddles, uh, even though he couldn't be here, uh, because he's uh, helped well, I'm really sorry because I'm world champ. I'm a champion duck caller too. Is that right? Yeah, I hunted all my life, and and I won the Mason Dixon Duck Calling Championship three times in a row. Does so. that does that require an external device or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. maybe we can uh, we'll get a little example of that after. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. But um, Puddles would uh, love for you to have this genuine Tuba People TV glass. Well, thank you. Uh, with his compliments. And mine also. Well, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much, John. You're welcome. I'll put a beverage of choice in there. It sounds delicious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and now back to you. <laughs> so you say you're a, a, a champion duck caller. <laughs> I hear puddles right now. He's that's he's a, answering back. That's that's a hunting call. It's not a contest call. But, oh, okay. Uh, All right. What's a contest call? It's smoother. Oh. And and a little more musical instrument like. It's very good. It's like a, it's like a recital. I mean, except you're doing a duck call. <laughs> <laughs>